In 2003, Congress passed the Prison Rape Elimination Act to protect offenders from sexual assault by prison staff members and other inmates. This video presentation covers federal and state law, facility policy, your rights, the phases of sexual assault, prevention strategies, and reporting. This orientation is intended to inform and prepare you on the topic of sexual abuse in correctional facilities. Sexual abuse is a serious security threat in a detention center. It increases violence among inmates, spreads disease, disrupts family relationships, and promotes property theft and extortion by predators who act as if they own the victim. The good news is that it doesn't have to happen to you. By knowing your rights, taking advantage of your access to outside advocates, and the prevention strategies outlined in this video, you can serve your sentence without being sexually abused by other inmates or staff members. Whatever you are serving time for, remember that no one deserves to be raped behind bars. So, know your rights, report sexual abuse, and take these simple steps to prevent sexual abuse. The New Mexico Legislature passed a law, Statute 30-9-11, which makes it a second-degree felony for a correctional staff member to have sex with an inmate. If a staff member is caught having sex with an inmate, that staff member cannot claim the defense of consent. Also, there is a federal law against sexual assaults inside correctional facilities called the Prison Rape Elimination Act, or PREA. This applies to staff on inmate as well as inmate on inmate sexual abuse. Sex between inmates and sexual abuse by staff are against our institutional policy. Our zero tolerance policy places a duty on staff and inmates to report sexual abuse. It also commits this facility to taking reports of sexual abuse seriously and to investigating and punishing those who perpetrate sexual abuse. It is also our policy to refer substantiated cases for prosecution. While in this facility, you are protected under the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause of the Eighth Amendment from sexual abuse. If you are sexually abused by another inmate or by a staff member, you may seek redress under Statute 41-4-2, the New Mexico Tort Claims Act. You may also seek redress under a 1983 federal civil rights claim. You can obtain these forms from the Facility Education Department. A decision by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in Jordan v. Gardner makes it a civil rights violation for a male officer to pat search a female inmate, though there is no such prohibition on female officers searching male inmates. Victims of sexual abuse may be taken to an outside clinic for a medical forensic exam. Victims also have access to facility medical and mental health services. The medical forensic examinations provided by an external clinic, as well as facility medical and mental health services, are provided without charge. Victims have the right to decline any of these services. Both PREA and facility policy prohibit retaliation against those who report sexual abuse. Institutional policy requires both staff and inmates who witness or hear a disclosure of sexual abuse to report it immediately. Hiding or suppressing evidence of a crime could constitute tampering with evidence and may result in disciplinary action or prosecution. Now let's discuss the terms sexual abuse, sexual contact, and sexual harassment. The term sexual abuse means subjecting another person to any sexual act or contact by force, persuasion, or enticement. It includes subjecting another person who is incapable of giving consent by reason of their custodial status, physical, or mental state to sexual contact, rape, or molestation, prostitution, or other forms of sexual exploitation. The term sexual contact means intentional touching or physical contact in a sexual manner, either directly or through the clothing of the genitalia, anus, groin, breast, inner thigh, or buttocks, with or without the consent of the person, or any touching or inappropriate viewing with the intent to arouse, humiliate, harass, degrade, or gratify the sexual desire of any person. This does not mean that staff cannot perform pat searches on inmates. In Terry v. Ohio, the Supreme Court ruled that pat searches are legal and correctional facilities have a genuine interest in stopping inmates from trafficking in weapons and contraband. The important distinction in the definition is if the contact is made in a sexual manner. 
pad searches performed in the course of an officer's duties do not constitute sexual contact. The term sexual harassment means sexual advances, sexually offensive language, influencing, promising, or threatening any inmate or staff's safety, custody status, privacy, housing privileges, or program status in exchange for personal gain or favors of a sexual nature. It also includes creating or encouraging an atmosphere of intimidation, hostility, or offensiveness as perceived by any individual who observes the sexually offensive language or behavior. As we mentioned in the introduction to this video, it's not enough just to report and treat sexual abuse after they happen. Prevention of sexual abuse is a priority under the Prison Rape Elimination Act, and this facility takes steps to prevent sexual abuse. These include pre-employment screening of officer candidates to identify those who have a high risk of being sexually abusive or who have an arrest record for sexual abuse, training staff on the law and facility policy, inmate rights, the dynamics of sexual abuse, recognizing the signs of sexual abuse, ethics training, crime scene preservation, and evidence collection, the use of video monitoring equipment, a formal system for providing resources, reporting, and investigating sexual abuse, and inmate screening and assessment at intake to identify those inmates who are at risk for victimization or for being sexually abusive. In addition to these steps, you can also minimize your risk of being sexually abused by avoiding undue familiarity with staff and other inmates, not accepting gifts or favors from other inmates, avoiding staff and inmates who are overly friendly, avoiding protective pairing with another inmate, not flirting with staff or other inmates, avoiding gambling, the debt you may have to pay may be sexual favors, avoiding drugs and alcohol, they may be mixed with a depressant to reduce your ability to resist rape. Buying only small amounts of commissary. This may reduce your risk of being a target of extortion for protection from sexual abuse. Respecting other inmates' personal space, privacy, and belongings. Avoid bragging about how tough you are, as aggressive inmates may see that as a challenge. Not isolating yourself in places where sexual abuse can occur. You can protect yourself by paying attention to your surroundings and others' behaviors. Rape in a correctional facility has the dynamics of rape anywhere. A victim will experience a number of phases connected to the rape, and knowing these phases can help you avoid being a victim. The first phase is the pre-assault phase. This includes a grooming phase in which the perpetrator tries to lower your ability to resist assault by gaining your trust and overcoming your defense mechanisms. Examples of this include the perpetrator providing you with commissary items until you get some money in your canteen account. The perpetrator may try to get you into an easy job or education assignment. He may tell you which inmates are dangerous and are to be avoided and steer you towards safe inmates who may actually be in on the planned rape. The perpetrator may offer you homemade alcohol or smuggled drugs. The perpetrator may even stage an attempted assault against you by other inmates and then intervene giving the appearance that he is protecting you from other inmates. What the perpetrator is trying to do is isolate you and make you dependent on him. During the pre-assault phase, you may have an intuitive sense that something is wrong. But because you are new to the prison environment and unfamiliar with the dynamics of the housing unit, you may ignore your intuition. The second phase is the assault phase in which the actual abuse takes place. If you have accepted commissary items or favors from the perpetrator, the perpetrator will play on your sense of obligation telling you that you owe the sexual favor and that refusal will result in your being left without protection from the dangerous inmates who want to rape you. Whether you are coerced into sex with the perpetrator or physically attacked by several perpetrators, you may feel a sense of disbelief that this has happened to you. You may experience a sense of paralysis, numbness, detachment, an absence of emotional response, and a reduced awareness of your surroundings. You may have a loss of memory trying to block out the event. You may also feel shame, self-blame, and a sense that you are somehow responsible for allowing the abuse to happen. Remember, it is not your fault. These feelings are related to the grooming that occurred during the pre-assault phase. The third phase of a sexual assault is called the acute crisis phase. In this phase, you may re-experience the rape through intrusive images that may be violent, 
or intrusive thoughts that may include suicide. You may experience dreams, flashbacks, a sense of reliving the trauma, and emotional distress when exposed to reminders of the trauma. You may experience severe depression that disrupts your ability to function in your work or education assignment. Finally, you may adopt avoidance tactics to keep from having to address the assault. The fourth phase of sexual assault is the outward adjustment phase. In this phase, you just want everything to be normal again. You may appear comfortable in discussing the assault, and you may contend that everything is fine, and you may claim that you have successfully dealt with the issue. But you may often engage in mechanical compliance with the continued abuse, disengaging emotionally just to get through their sentence. Suppressed rage may surface accompanied by violent behavior directed at other inmates. You may experience disruptions in your family relationships as well. The fifth phase of a sexual assault is the resolution phase. In this phase, you will try to incorporate the assault into your personal history and chart a course for your future. In attempting a resolution, you may re-experience all the elements of the acute crisis phase. You will reevaluate your lifestyle and your life choices. After release from the facility, you will attempt to reestablish normal relationships with your parents, spouse, and children, and it may not be easy. If you become the victim of a sexual assault, the mental health provider at this facility can provide crisis intervention, emotional support, and counseling. They can also provide you the phone number of the local rape crisis center, which is also listed in your orientation manual. One of the problems in investigating sexual assaults is timeliness. Timely reporting is critical to effective investigations. If an assault is not reported within 120 hours or five days of the abuse, evidence that can substantiate a claim of sexual assault such as bruising, injury, and DNA can be lost. If evidence is lost, it is harder to prove the crime. If you are sexually abused, there are four things you can do to preserve evidence. To the extent possible, do not take a shower, do not brush your teeth, do not wash your clothes, and do not relieve yourself. By taking these four steps, you are preserving evidence to positively identify the perpetrator and establish the crime. You are also providing details that can corroborate your claim, establishing your credibility. To report sexual abuse, a victim or witness can write directly to the facility administrator or investigator, file a grievance, disclose the abuse to a medical or mental health professional, call the local rape crisis center, the phone number is included in the orientation manual, call the facility's sexual abuse hotline, this phone number is also written in your orientation manual. Have a family member or friend report it to the facility. When writing to the administrator, investigator, or anyone else, be sure to make a dated copy for yourself. That way, if the original is lost, you will have a duplicate. This is important to prevent perpetrators from suppressing reports of sexual abuse by claiming that no written report was ever made. This facility uses only investigators who are trained to conduct objective and thorough investigations. The investigator will collect physical evidence, witness testimony, written statements from the victim and the perpetrator, and video surveillance recordings. Once the investigation is concluded, you will be informed of the results of the investigation. Because the federal government collects data on sexual abuse in correctional facilities, the investigation will be included in reports to the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. We hope that you have been helped by this video. Sexual abuse in a correctional facility makes our institution more dangerous for inmates and staff alike. The sexual abuse of inmates is a violation of both federal and state law and is prohibited by institutional policy. You are also protected from cruel and unusual punishment through the United States and New Mexico constitutions. If you are sexually abused, you have recourse through the courts through a New Mexico Tort Claims Act and through a 1983 civil rights claim. It is important to remember that our facilities policy requires you to report sexual abuse and you will not experience retaliation for doing so. If you have any questions about the Prison Rape Elimination Act, speak to the intake or booking officer or ask your case manager or counselor. Remaining silent about sexual abuse is not a safe strategy for doing your time and may be interpreted as a signal that you are easy prey. Know your rights, report sexual abuse, and remember these simple steps to prevent sexual abuse from happening to you while you are here.